What does the term legacy mean to you? That term has basically defined the past seven years of my life. After the sudden passing of my mom in 2012 on New Year's Day, I dedicated my life to keeping her legacy and her love for photography alive. I treasured it. And every time I pick up a camera, I'm reminded of her. Some of the worst years of my life were followed by some of the most successful. What's interesting is that while I dedicated all of my time towards keeping her legacy alive, it slowly evolved into my own. It was her love for photography that influenced me to pursue this creative career path. Now, seven years later, I found my own love for it. Her death changed how I lived my life. I stopped waiting for things to happen, believing that things would change on their own. Nothing is guaranteed in this life. Not even tomorrow. It took the death of my mom to make me realize that, but it ultimately saved my life and changed it forever. Welcome everybody to today's Leica conversation. This is an ongoing series of talks and webinars designed to spark conversation and inspire visual storytelling. I'm your host, John Kreidler, product specialist for Leica Camera USA. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce today's guest, Jay Casario. Jay is a professional wedding photographer and studio owner in South Jersey. Jay has a unique approach that has made him a sought after industry speaker and workshop leader. His approach is based on the desire to get to know his clients beyond uh, the signed contract and the first meeting. Uh, both he and his wife, Sandy, have worked very hard to create a brand and a company that really provides uh, a visual story of uh, their client's wedding day. Uh, <clears throat> to do this, you know, they need to know the clients, but also the family and which uh, relationships are perhaps the most cherished as well as which events during the course of that day are mission critical to tell this epic story of their wedding day. Uh, today, Jay will be showing us uh, how he is uh, building a legacy with Leica products. Jay uses a variety of cameras, each one taking a different role uh, in, his work, in his workflow and creating images in concert that tell the tale of his clients, again, epic day. Jay will also discuss how the properties of each Leica camera, their unique files, uh, how they allow him to create images that wow his clients, as well as tell the narrative of the day. Join me in giving a warm welcome to Jay Casario. Jay. Hey, thanks for having me, John. Hey, thanks for being here. Long time. It's been a long time. Yeah, since, it's going uh, to be awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. So how have you been in these COVID times? Uh, you know, probably the same as everybody else listening in on us. It's, uh, yeah. it's been interesting to say the least. But I'm good, man. Good. Good to see you. That's good. Good seeing you. So, uh, so let's dive in. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your journey and you uh, becoming one of today's top 100 wedding photographers. I grew up in photography. 
um, it was around me my entire life. My mom was a photographer. She was uh, actually a wedding photographer. Um, my entire household, it was, it was a very artistic household. I grew up in uh, my mom constantly pushed the arts and you know, that's what, uh, it's all I remember as a child. Uh, okay. All through high school, I, you know, I, I remember uh, receiving art awards and you know, that was my main focus was always art. Uh, I received, received a scholarship to the Philadelphia School of Arts and I turned it down. It was uh, being young and kind of uh, being told what to, you know, what to do and learning about the history of art. And it was something that kind of killed it for me and ruined it for me. And I, I just- I, I find that hard to believe, Jay. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Uh, shocking, shocking. So yeah, I kinda, that kind of killed it for me. And I okay. passed up on the opportunity to go to, you know, take a full ride to college. And my parents were very happy about that, as you can imagine. Naturally, naturally. And instead I went to community college, which was, uh, yeah, that, that went well. Um, so yeah, right out of college, I ended up, I got offered a job as an engineer. And okay. I was offered a job at $50,000 a year. And at the time, you know, that seemed like a ton of money. I was mm. going to be rich. And, you know, <laughs> it's amazing looking back to, at what my, you know, uh, what I was thinking at the time. But yeah, I took that right. job and, you know, I, I ended up being an engineer for 15 years. Wow. Um, and, you know, at that point, I'd given up on anything creative or in the arts. Gotcha. Uh, my father was never really big on that career path to begin with. So it seemed okay. like a logical, logical choice. My, my father was an engineer and, you know, I went okay. down. Makes sense. Uh, during college, I got into like the fitness bodybuilding world. And I, what I ended up, I found myself. Did you ever do any pro wrestling? I, I, you know what I did? I was Triple H for a while. Okay, just wanted to similarity there. A lot of people yeah. were getting asked. Questions are pouring in. Just, I'm sure there's a few. Uh, so yeah, I, I found myself on the other end of the camera and it kind of like brought me back around to the creative side of, you know, a career okay. path. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was in fitness magazines and I was doing photo shoots with photographers to be in fitness magazines. Okay. And it kind of got me intrigued about photography, not a ton, but mm -hmm. it, it started to make me realize what my mom had been doing all those years. Okay. And, yeah. You know, how much was involved with it. And it wasn't just, you know, clicking the shutter and taking photos. So, you know, time goes on and, you know, I'm, I'm 30, I'm in my early thirties, I'm 32 and I'm, I'm living in a cubicle for eight to 10 hours a day uh looking out a window to a parking lot and it was basically you know a career path that i wasn't happy with it was dragging gotcha. me down i feel like a hamster in a hamster wheel and you know it, it was something that i often questioned like how did i get here uh, mm -hmm. i was still i was making under you know right around a hundred thousand dollars a year but after a 15-year career it wasn't much um yeah. so then I turned 32 and my mom suddenly passes away. We yeah. were on a family vacation. Uh, it wasn't wow. anything that we were uh, anticipating. Right. And she passed away while, you know, me and my wife were in the same room. So you can imagine wow. that kind of <clears throat> shook my world a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Um, it also woke me up. Uh, it mm. changed, it, it basically changed everything in my life at that point. Um, it, I guess you could say, made me question everything that I had done up to that point. It made mm -hmm. me realize how short life was. And right. I decided I needed to make a lot of changes in my life. Okay. So that's what I did. And it wasn't long after she passed that one, a friend of hers had asked, Hey, since your mom was a wedding photographer, you know, I have a daughter that's getting married. Do you know anything about wedding photography to where you can, you know, possibly photograph my daughter's wedding? Right. And at the time, you know, I, <laughs> I'd picked up a camera a few times and knew the basics. Right. I mean, how difficult could it be, right? That's the way I looked at it. So <laughs> I, uh, of course, I said, yes, I'll do it. Okay. And 
it went surprisingly well. Uh, you know, I wow. taught my wife how to use a camera mm -hmm. and we both photographed the wedding. You know, we were extremely nervous and we didn't charge, mm -hmm. you know, I only think we charged $500. Okay. But that was basically the start of our, our okay. bet down, you know, the wedding industry and photographing weddings. Interesting. Um, so I, I guess then how, how did you end up using the, the Leica M for weddings? Um, I, I, I'm guess I, cause we've worked together before. I know that you've, that you really started with, uh, with the M, uh, in shooting weddings. Um, and a lot of people probably think that that's pretty unusual manual focusing camera, but what was, what was your thought process and why did you, you go in that direction? It came down to those first few weddings that we photographed, me and my wife. They were either friends of the family or friends of ours that got married. And we noticed that, you know, we were able to capture real moments and moments that I couldn't see other professional photographers getting that they might not have known or trusted. So I noticed that, we both noticed that, because of that trust level that was there prior to their wedding day, we were able to be in those moments and capture those moments as they, as they happened. And that's kind of what we built our brand around. After we did that, we realized, you know, let's take the time and get to know our clients. And that way mm -hmm. it was the storytelling side of things that kind of drew us in. And if we're going to tell a story, the only way that we really saw that being possible was to get to know the clients get to know their family know okay. who the main players are in the story and that kind of you know built our brand gotcha so uh this uh this particular wedding this groom you're you're doing groom prep uh with with the m and kind of take us through some of these images that we're going to look look at uh here with the next five or so images kind of take us through the the process of the day and how really the uh how the M allowed you to capture these, these moments. So this was actually one of the first weddings I shot the M on. And this, the groom is actually in the leopard polka dot um, bathrobe. <laughs> and uh, he's actually the owner of Alan's camera, uh, a local camera store to us. And he asked me to photograph his wedding, which was a huge honor at the time. It was oh, still early yeah. in our career, but this was one of those first weddings after, you know, trying the M out and using it a little bit that I realized mm -hmm. not only the trust level with the clients, but not having flashes going off or having a big, you know, DSLR in their faces, they were able gotcha. to kind of be themselves. They weren't worried about what I was doing so much as to just focusing on what they were doing. And I was kind of, it made me, it made things click for me that I was able to be more of a fly on the wall with a smaller camera that was more quiet. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, this was, this was the wedding that kind of kicked it off for me as far as Leica is concerned. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can tell they're uh, very candid, uh, candid moments. Um, you know, these are two, two brothers. I'm, I'm guessing the best man and, and the yeah, this is Brandon um, and, his, and his older brother. Okay. Neat. <clears throat> and then, um, so just kind of picking, picking the moments and here I, I start to see the development of, of, uh, what I recognize as your, your visual signature with the, always trying to have a, a foreground point of interest and then, you know, sharp, sharp focus, uh, and that kind of thing. Was, was it at this point where you started, um, to really begin to formulate in your, in your mind's eye that, the type of images you're going to start to craft. Yeah, it was. And, you know, gear was something I never really wanted to talk about all that much uh, because I really felt like the gear aspect of it wasn't all that important, but it, it was this wedding that, you know, made me realize, you know, how much that more of a fly on the wall I could be in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, they weren't really concerned with me because I didn't have a big camera in their face. But yeah, this kind of set me off with my style and our brand as a studio. 
th especially this image here that you pulled up, this, this was a moment, honestly, that even like today I look back and I think about how important this was in uh, not only my, you know, my career, but the entire studios. Mm -hmm. uh, his, the groom's father had passed away, um, right. the previous owner of the camera shop. And he was very close to his father and his wife had gave him a gift and he had, you know, went into uh, the bedroom of the hotel and it was only him and his brother. And mm -hmm. I, I had a feeling it was going to be something emotional. He kind of kept it together the whole day. And I knew at some point he was going to break. He had to, I would have. Um, right. And I, rather than kind of giving him a space, I, I made right. the decision to kind of, you know, to go in there with him and having talked to him and got to know him and built that trust level beforehand, mm -hmm. I knew that that wouldn't be an issue. It wasn't a question right. in my mind that, you know, this was something that he would get mad at or be unhappy with. I knew right. that he was comfortable and trusted me to be there. Right. Uh, the, the videographers, you know, I, I, this was, you know, this was a, a huge turning point for me because I watched as they left the room and mm -hmm. felt uncomfortable being in there. So they missed right. all of this and right. I was able to capture it. So right. his wife gave him a gift. It was a, it was a pendant with his father's photo, him and his father. Okay. And okay. I captured it as it happened. You know, I, mm. tried, you know, I did my best to not get in their way and just let them have their moments. Right. And I was able to capture images like this that I know. Wow. It's an image that I know to this day he still cherishes, which, you know, means the world. Yeah, very powerful. What, which, uh, which M were you using at this point? Um, this, was, this was actually the M9. Okay. And you know, you know, even with its, you know, it, it was one of the first, it was the first full mm -hmm. frame for like, it still, you know, did an amazing job here. Gotcha. No, it's, uh, it's great. It's great. So, um, what, uh, so obviously there's a lot of black and white weddings are basically monochromatic. I mean, for the most part, are these, uh, so you're shooting the, the M9, the color version and then converting uh, converting things to black and white is that yeah for the what? everything up until actually a couple months ago uh okay. first shot the the monochrome uh I, everything you see that it's black and white for me has been converted over to okay black and white from color yeah i mean just real powerful images again uh you know kind of your signature style with um with uh, a little bit of flair uh what, what lens What's your primary lens your, or your go-to lenses? So for the first few years that I shot the M, it was, it was mostly a 35 and a 50. Uh, mm -hmm. A 35 when I knew that I could be up a little bit closer into the moment and a 50 when I, I felt that I had to stand back a little bit further away. This was shot with, you know, a, a 35. I think it was a 35 summer looks at the time. Okay. And I was able to get up close enough. This was a street artist in Philly I was able to get a mm -hmm. close enough to him. I mean, and this just shows you how in obstructive or, you know, uh, how close. I mean, I it's really street style, right? I mean, it's street it style right. and really allowing that intimacy of the moment. And really, as a viewer looking at the image, you really get a sense of, of the atmosphere, what was happening. Um, and I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that in, in terms of other, other cameras that you've used, uh, I mean, could you, I guess, could you do a similar image with a DSLR of, of some nature? No, I don't think I could. And the reason I say that, I'm sure a lot of people watching this are, you know, are questioning why I feel that way. Mm -hmm. But it, it, for those of you who have used a rangefinder in the past or, you know, are more familiar with a DSLR or even right. a mirrorless is when you're layering and you're using a lot of foreground in your photos. Autofocus can fail you a lot of times, and, it, and it's you know mm -hmm. not by fault of the autofocus system. It's just you know if it picks up that foreground element, then your right. shot is, your shot's ruined. With the rangefinder, you can. It's so much easier to focus on your clients and not have to worry about those foreground elements anymore. And that was one of the things that drew me into the M right off the bat. Was you know. All the all the struggles I'd had and trouble I'd had with the you know autofocus mm -hmm. using foreground elements it almost kind of pushed me away from using foreground elements at at one point. Okay. And then when I 
I started shooting the M, it was, you know, wow, okay, I can do this now. Yeah. Uh, especially like with this image, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm using the foreground uh, elements to create and compose a better composition. Right. If I had been using a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, you know, autofocus would have been jumping around. It would have probably at some point grabbed the mm -hmm. foreground elements, those flowers. But with an M, it's so much easier to lock on my focus, right? The bride and groom, even as they're running, and not worry about those foreground elements with the autofocus, you know, right. missing the shot for me. So yeah, it was it was a huge and also the the environment. You know, uh, we talk uh, or consider, uh, you know, the setting, the venue that couples take. A lot of wedding photography kind of just doesn't even look at the venue, doesn't consider the venue. But uh, in your work, it, it seems that it's intrinsic into part of that visual style and that your visual storytelling. Uh, yeah, environmental portraits are big in my work and our brands. Yeah. Um, they're, to me, as a storyteller, they're huge. It, you know, even when I watch a movie, um, those type of shots where it shows off the environment, you know, the scene, it, it tells so much more of a story. Mm -hmm. and I think the biggest hurdle for me as a wedding photographer early on was that, you know, I caught a lot of flack when I would post images and, you know, I would, <laughs> I would try to get a lot of likes or try to get attention, right. get feedback on them. And it would, I would post one right. and it would be like, well, I can't see, you know, I would get comments, but I can't really see the, the couple, you know, I can't right. really see who they are, you know, if the couple's even smaller. Why do right. I need that much scenery behind? Well, as a storyteller, this is, it's, it's not just about one photo, it's about the whole story. And right. this photo in this couple's story would be followed by a shot that's a little bit more closer up. So, right. you know, even when I got married, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I was kind of disappointed with, with my own wedding photographer was that I put a lot of time into finding the wedding venue that I got married in. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, I, I was the one who picked the wedding venue that we got married at and to have, you know, not to have any photos of that was kind of disappointing. So right. it was something that I set out to really focus on as far as the story. Right. Especially when you're trying to create the entire, that narrative of the day. That's it's, true. It's very true. important. It's a big, a big part of it. So yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we started off um, with, uh, a video uh, that you created, uh, The Legacy, and um, kind of tell us a little bit about, about how, that, how that came about and, um, and just kind of the, the idea conceptually, like how, how did you, I guess, think it up? How, how did you, you create it? Uh, were there people that you worked with? You know, t tell us a little bit about that, that experience, because I know, Many photographers um, probably watching right now, uh, they, they need to do video and they need to create video and video is becoming a bigger part of our story, not just uh, within the, the wedding world, but everywhere within photography. So what, what can you tell us about that experience? So that, that experience started with one of our wedding clients. Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the relationship that I build with our clients mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't not, you know, I'm not good at video at all. Uh, Photography is my thing. I struggle with video. I try to do it here and there, but mm -hmm. I really wanted to work on a project with one of my past grooms and, you know, with the, okay. just to give you a, everybody an idea of, you know, the level of trust and the level of, that I get to know each and every client, uh, Matt, that you see, this is me and Sandy with the bride and groom, Matt and his wife, Amy. And the first time I met the two of them was when they came into our studio and they wanted to meet us and see if they wanted to hire us to photograph their wedding. Matt being a videographer who had, you know, been on, you know, been in the industry for a long time, not the wedding industry, but the, the film industry, he, you know, he was standoffish and it was, it's funny looking back now, we're, we're extremely, you know, we're very good friends. Uh, he's probably one of my closest friends now. 
And, you know, that came about just from getting to know him as a client. And, you know, we, we hang out a lot and it was, it was the idea of working with him on a project and the fact that I had just gotten the Leica SL2 and I really wanted to put something together for that and also kind of tell my story a little bit. And he wanted to do the same. I photographed his wedding and, you know, there was a very emotional side to his wedding. Um, his wife had been going through some things and she, I know he's probably watching, so I'll just, uh, I know he won't mind me saying this. You know, his wife had uh, battled cancer uh, before they got married. She had been diagnosed with cancer after he proposed and uh, she battled it throughout their entire engagement. And then she was, she was doing much better by the time that they got married, thankfully. And he was, he had an emotional day. So, you know, being part of that and capturing these moments for him, you know, it was special to him and it was special to me. Uh, and it, you know, made our relationship that much closer. So we set out to do this project and it, it was, the, the word legacy was kind of important to us because not only did we go through this, this together, his wedding day, um, but shortly afterwards, his father had passed. So the fact that my photography career got started by basically keeping the love, you know, the love of photography that my mother had alive and just keeping me closer to her, uh, that word legacy was pretty important to both of us. So we, he came into the studio, we sat down and we came up with this idea of the video, how we wanted to shoot it, the story we wanted to tell. And this was the first project that we worked on together. Uh, once we finished it, he said, you know, he called me up and said he was done editing it. Uh, he wanted to see my reaction because I got to see his when I showed him the wedding photos for the first time. And it was, you know, extremely emotional for me getting to watch that video. It's still emotional to watch it even just before this. Um, it, it still makes my eyes water. But, you know, I couldn't be more thankful for the friendship I have with him and that, you know, I got to meet him through, you know, the, what my photography and wedding photography, you know, and we have a few more projects in the works that we're working on. And yeah, it was, it was definitely one of the, the, one of the most important projects that I've worked on to this point. I, I think it's, it's a, it's a great, uh, great piece. And it really, uh, you know, it, it tells, it tells a story. Uh, I, Zoom doesn't do it justice. Uh, so is that, is that posted somewhere? Maybe we can put a link uh, in the chat if, you know, people want to view it or download it. Yeah. And if you get, if you could, that'd be awesome. Uh, you can find it on my YouTube page. Um, okay. At, you know, I don't think Matt has it anywhere, but you can view it on my YouTube page. Uh, it's a little bit more crisp. So yeah, if you guys could check it out, that'd be awesome. That's, that's great. Uh, I think we're going to move on to uh, the COVID time and talk a little bit about the wedding business during COVID. How has that changed, uh, changed how the studio works and kind of your, your approach uh, to work and what you're working on? That's a touchy one, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, COVID is basically... Uh, decimated the wedding industry. We, we've had over a hundred weddings postponed until next year. Uh, it's been a, it's been a rough time. It's, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's also pushed us to kind of offer uh, new products and new services to our clients. And it's, you know, as tough as a time as it's been, it's, uh, you know, it kind of opens the doors to new things in the future. Uh, this shot here, I mean, this was one of the one of the micro weddings that has become popular now. So we've had a lot of those where a client might want to put off the majority of their wedding until next year, but they still want to have the ceremony and that way they still get married this year. So, you know, we've done a, a bunch of these micro weddings and, you know, it makes us feel a little bit more like we're, you know, back to normal with these type of ceremonies and you know it's been uh it's been good that these clients have been able to do these so an image like this are you using the rangefinder or are you zone focusing 
No, this is, yeah, this is with the rangefinder, and this is shot at, uh, this is wide open at 1.4, and this was right behind the bride's, uh, where she grew up at, you know, her parents' house. The woods was, woods kind of have like an eerie feel to it, and we thought that it would be like the perfect opportunity to kind of give the perspective of the time that we're in right now, and, you know, with their custom wedding masks on, uh, it, it turned out exactly, you know, what they wanted as far as a photo goes to remember not only their wedding, but the time that they got married. In. What's your, what's your go-to wedding kit? What are you taking with you when you're going to shoot? So when I need autofocus, I have the SL2. Uh, you know, there's certain parts of a wedding day that for me, I, I really... I still want that depth. I still want to be able to shoot wide open. And without all the focus, I just won't be able to do that. Uh, particularly like the ceremony, uh, you know, parts of the reception. And then the, the rest of the day, I can kind of bounce back and forth depending on what my goal is. If I'm capturing moments and being documentary, like with this shot, I'm using the M. This was, I took this with the M10. And this was, even though it's zone focusing, I, I think I've shot it at 2.8. And, you know, I missed a few. I'm sure I did, but there's a few that I nailed, like this one. And they're great moments. Other times, you know, I, I could have an M10 on my left hip and, you know, the SL2 on the other. So right now for my wedding kit, it's, it's basically those two cameras. And for me and for my style of shooting, they work out, they work out perfect. So what's the uh, experience like between those two cameras when you're, when you're shooting and how do you decide, you know, I'm going to shoot the M for this, this, and this, and I'm going to use the SL2 uh, for other, other images. And then with, I guess, within both of those kind of describe the, the lens, the lens of choice, do you find yourself gravitating to specific lenses you know, based on those bodies and how you like to, to shoot them. Uh, th this, this photo here is a, a great example of why I use the app. And it's to basically be unintrusive, to be a fly on the wall. This, this entire wedding I shot on the M10, two M10s. They, the clients were, well, the groom was a, a like a photographer himself. So he had asked that, you know, if I would be willing to shoot his wedding on just the M10s. And I did. And it's moments like this that I could see why someone would want that. I was basically able to, you know, catch moments like this without the father of the bride reading the, the wedding uh, pamphlet. I forget, I'm having a brain program. program. Program, there you go. So the father of the, of the bride reading the wedding program and I, I, I don't think he ever knew I was there. Um, I zoned focused this and uh, got my, knew where the focal plane was, held it out over top of him and, and captured this image. And he, like I said, he never knew I was there. And you know, most of the day, nobody knew I was there. I mean, a lot of people thought I was just a guest and it worked out perfectly. I mean, it's, to, to me, it's an image that, kind of really sets a mood, sets a tone. And I would agree with you that an M is really the only camera that's going to allow you to, to take that kind of image. Um, you know, if you heard the, the click of a DSLR, it's, it's just going to, it's going to break, break the moment. Let's talk to about this image. Um, so what camera were you using and kind of set, <laughs> set it up for us? Cause I, to me, it's it's not an image I would think of within the the context of a wedding. Yeah, I wouldn't either, to be honest with you. And I mean, you know, throughout the day, I, I definitely look for those images. And this was up on the rooftop of where the bride and groom lived. This was a you know a spot where she would go and lay on the sun herself sometimes. So, you know, being in the midday sun, I think it was like one or two o'clock. You know, we went up on the rooftop. It was, I think, I believe it was shortly after their ceremony. 
and you know having never been up there myself we you know we go up there and I get to see everything for the first time and I look around and I see these two girls sunbathing and I said I see the ledge over there and you know I still want to not be too hands-on with them so I let them you know do their thing and they went over and just had a moment to themselves and with the M, you know, not, not worrying about autofocus, I was able to kind of sit back a little bit, not have a camera or a big camera up to my eye and, you know, freak these girls out. What I was doing with the camera, they looked up, they glanced up and, you know, I told them, hey, I'm just, I'm taking a picture of a bride and groom behind you. You guys are going to be blurry, you know, just trust me on this. Surprisingly, they did. And, you know, I was able to take a few shots with them in the foreground and you know this is probably one of my one of my favorite wedding shots that I've taken uh, over the years. So was this during a, like a first look, or uh, you know before the ceremony, after the ceremony? Where did it fit into their day? Uh, this was after the ceremony, I think. You know, uh, I I believe this was after they got married. We went back into the city and you know took a few took uh, about an hour's worth of portraits. Have you ever uh, used a Visiflex or an EVF2? I have, with, um, uh, and yeah, no, I did, when I shot with the M240, I did, I, and it, it made shots like this even, you know, easier to make. But with the M10 uh, or without, you know, any, any other type of EVF or, you know, any other way to look through the viewfinder, uh, I'll basically set my focus and get an idea of where the focus point is and then I know where I can you know where I need to keep the camera so I can raise it I can lower it uh, by hand and that way I don't necessarily have to be up in somebody's face with it uh, I can keep my body back a little bit and kind of fade back and keep the camera up which makes people feel a little bit more comfortable with you know having their photo taken if they're in the foreground so uh... I guess your clients, um, obviously they're attracted to your style. They, they see your, your type of photography, uh, during the, the course of, of the wedding day, you're looking to create, uh, very creative images, uh, images that aren't what many would consider, uh, traditional, uh, type set portraits of, of all these very artistic, looking uh, incredibly interesting photographic images, I mean, to, to myself. How many of these uh, do your clients pick and end up in the, you know, in the final album or in the, uh, the, the highlight reel, however they want to use the, the images or have prints made? Yeah, you know, I, I found that over the years, um, you know, I have my own favorite shots that I take. My wife is hers and then the client is theirs. Um, I do find that when it comes to creating the album, which is basically our, our biggest thing is that we want the clients, our wedding clients to, you know, get an album and 99% of them do. And it comes with their wedding package. It's the story of their wedding day. So they, they get to pick the images that go into that album. And I found that over the years, I've kind of got a feeling for what clients like and what they don't like. And as far as telling a story goes, and you know, they they basically want the same things that I do. There, there's still images from time to time where I stretch the artistic uh, side of things a little bit, and they might not like that. Where I love it. And I still, I'm taking it for their purpose, you know, hoping that they do like it, but um, it's something that they might not include in the album. And, you know, they, they could end up getting it in like a canvas or a print, but yeah, it's, it is funny at times to see difference in what they like and what we like. But, you know, as, to, as time has gone on, years have gone on, it's, it's, we've learned what clients have you know, what they want, what they're looking for and what they like. Images like this one in, in Philadelphia, you know, I, I know that I knew that they wanted uh, parts of Philly and the streets of Philly kind of incorporated into their story. 
So this was one of the images that they had uh, a full spread of in their album. And, you know, when I see stuff like that, I mean, I couldn't be happier. You know, it's, it's uh, I mean, for looking at, from a photographic standpoint, again, foreground point of interest, uh, you know, really setting the stage of uh, where, where the images were taken, getting an idea of the venue, the feel, uh, and the couple. I mean, it's, to me, it's, it's very creative and it's, and it's very, uh, very interesting. So let's, let's circle back to, uh, I guess, to post COVID times. Uh, you were saying a lot of uh, micro weddings, uh, and I'm sure they present challenges. Like for me, the biggest, I mean, the challenge for me as a photographer, just thinking about it would be not so much the couple, but the groups, right? The family. I guess, what have you done in those instances where uh, they may have, what, 40 or 50 people in attendance and they want, and they want group photos of the family. How, how does that work uh, in today's, today's world? It's went pretty smooth. Um, no, not at all. I, uh, <laughs> the, the very first micro wedding that I did, and it was a ceremony that had only, I think it was maybe 20 to 25 guests. It was uh, eye-opening to me because you know, you get in the groove of photographing the day and it kind of puts you back into pre-COVID times when we weren't having to worry about who we're, you know, social distancing from or, you know, wearing a mask around. So it, the very first one, the very first wedding I, I shot, when it came time to family photos, I, you know, I called the family up and it was a, a family of about, you know, uh, 12 or 13 and the bride and groom, I put them in the middle, and this was now time for their posed, you know, formal photos. And they kept, you know, a few feet between each family member. And I looked at them and I thought, you know, all right, guys, come on, get closer. What are you doing? You know, but why are you in? It was, I completely just slipped my mind the times that we're, we're in. So, you know, once it clicked, it, all right the families that quarantine together are keeping a, a little bit of a social distance from each other and keeping their masks on until the very last moment before I take the photo. Um, yeah, it was, it was eye-opening because it was a reminder. I mean, uh, a real reminder of the times that we're in right now. And, you know, as far as my job's concerned, the changes I would need to make going forward with the weddings and how to pose family members and how to make the, a photo like that still look good and you know make the family happy uh, with the photo that i take while still keeping a, a safe distance from one another so yeah it's it's been interesting and uh hopefully it's over soon that's all i can say yeah we all hope for that what uh so since uh, I guess there have only been a few um, micro weddings, uh, what, what have you been doing to, to stay busy? Uh, what have you been working on? Do you have projects you've been working on? And, and, how's, and what, what's going on with the studio? So right now we've been doing our best to make 2021 as busy uh, as possible. We have all of, basically all of our 2020 clients that have moved to 2021, which has kept a lot of potential clients from booking because those dates are now taken up from this year's clients. But we've also, me personally, I've had the opportunity to focus more on a lot of the photo shoots that I would have just done in the past were creative purposes or marketing purposes, um, you know, or have shot for, you know, companies that I have affiliates with and I can now offer them to clients. And that's what I started doing. You know, uh, for example, like this photo here, this was a professional by violinist who tours with Michael Buble and she wanted some new photos for her portfolio. So we went into the Philly, Philly Navy base and took these 
but it's given me an opportunity to, to offer these now, these type of portraits or headshots uh, to clients. And, you know, not just, it's no longer just for creative purposes. It's something that I can offer professionally and make a little bit of money for uh, that I normally wouldn't have uh, been able to do. What, uh, what camera are you using uh, for this? And are you using any strobes or studio lighting, you know, for, for this type of, for this type of work? So this was with the S, the, not the, the newest one, not the S3. This is with the previous model, the 007. And it's a medium format camera, you know that, but uh, for everybody listening and it's all natural light. Uh, when it comes to shoots like this, uh, you know, I, I go back to, you know, what I would do for my creative shoots in the past. And I, I would shoot this and I did shoot this all natural light. And the S kind of gives that, it gives a little bit more of a more depth, more character. Uh, I mean, you can just see by this shot, it looks 3D. And that's one of the advantages to shooting the S. So it's, uh, it's, an, it's an awesome camera to use. It's fun to use. And for all of these shoots, you know, even in studio, uh, you know, I've been able to offer shoots like this and also boudoir shoots to, you know, uh, upcoming wedding clients. And I typically try to use the S, not only because it's, it's something different, uh, but it also, it gives, I mean, a look that I can't, I've never been able to find with any other camera. And you can see by this, it, you know, I love that depth that it gives. It's, uh, well, a big part of, of the S, the medium format, is that separation between plane of focus and foreground background. And I think that's really what you're connecting with. Uh, but it, overall, it's a very cinematic look. Those lenses have a, a different contrast that's different than M, different than the, the SL uh, native lenses. Uh, so we, we had a great question uh, from the audience. Um, They're asking, uh, is your style anyway influenced by uh, your mom's style of shooting? Uh, that's a good question because it's something I've thought about as one of those things I, I wish that I could have been able to do. You know, when she was alive, I didn't, uh, I didn't pay attention to her photography all that much, uh, sadly enough it was always a nuisance to me. It was always, there was a camera in my face. And, you know, if it wasn't taking pictures of me or my sister or, you know, family stuff, it was her asking me to look at the back of the camera to see a, a photo she took. I don't have uh, a great idea of her style. Um, I wish I did, you know, there's a lot of things that I wish I knew looking back now, you know, it wasn't until after after she passed it, I had my son. You know, there's so many things I wish I could have asked her about, you know, parenting. Uh, and it all, you know, it's all the same thing. It's, yeah, I wish I really knew more of her style to see if it, you know, if it was similar. I, I have no idea to this day. So in, in terms of post-processing and how does that fit into, into your style? Uh, you know, what are kind of the basic things that, uh, that you look to do uh, in terms of processing your images? Early on, I knew that I wanted to, not only knew that I wanted to, but I guess you could say knew that I had to make my work stand out. Um, and the best way for me to do that was to focus on finding an editing style that represented how I saw things when I took the photo. The color palette that felt natural to me and that was another thing that, that Leica sensors, I mean, they were the cameras that made it the easiest to get to that final look that I wanted. You know, when I first started shooting with Leica, I shot with Nikon, I shot with Canon, you know, I, I shot with Sony for a little bit. And yes, I could get the final look from any one of those, but it was Leica that, you know, their tones were roll out of the camera were the closest to the final product that I was going for. It was easier for me to get to that final look. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot that many people do not like about my editing process. They don't like the tones or they don't like the style. And you know what I've learned over the years that 
it's not going to be for everybody. I have clients that come to me specifically because they like the style that I know of our studio, the style that I've spent years, you know, creating. And uh, I focus on that. I focus on our clients and it really is um, interesting to see how there's, you know, as many people are, as there are that love our style, there's, you know, there's still a ton of people that don't like it. And, you know, it's basically what we built our brand around. And I think that's a lot, that's something that a lot of photographers have to come to grasp with. And that's getting used to the fact that when you're building a style that is, you know, that you want to represent you and help you stand out, it's not going to be for everybody. It's, you know, you have to think about, um, what's going to make your clients happy and what you want to help you stand out from, from the crowd. And I think that's, that's a great point. Uh, you know, kind of being true to your own vision. And I, I think what you do best, um, is that, that projection of, of who you are and this is what we deliver and then deliver it. So that, that kind of brings us back around to, to this building the legacy of, you know, a brand uh, using uh, Leica products that kind of fit how you like to shoot. And I guess if, if you had adv advice for anyone who's looking uh, to do, whether it's wedding photography or landscape or commercial or editorial, and they have a desire uh, to really, to build on a legacy in, in terms of an overall overarching concept, what, what advice uh, could you offer? The biggest thing is, as you know, John, is just finding what it is about you that makes you unique. And, you know, you hear that constantly, um, but it's particularly important when it comes to the creative world and, you know, art or photography. I think for me, it was, you know, I look back and I, um, one of the biggest things when it comes to the success that I've seen um, in the photography industry is that I got started late in life. Uh, I didn't, you know, it wasn't until after my mom passed, I was 32, 33 years old. So I had a, a good idea of what I needed to do. And what I've learned from teaching workshops, and I know you've seen the same thing, is that you know a lot of wedding photographers and photographers in general look to other photographers to you know get and find their style. They want to duplicate what somebody else has done, and you know, being in my early 30s and knowing that I needed to, if I was going to make a career out of this, I was going to come in and you know. I basically wanted to just change the industry and, and come in and stand out. So I, I set out and I, f I found a style that was my own. I, I didn't really look at other photographers. I went off of what I thought a wedding should look like. I went off of how, you know, how I thought a wedding should be photographed. And it was me and my wife together. We, you know, it, it all started honestly with this photo here. This was, you know, when she was pregnant with her son, uh, he turned six next month. And, you know, this was, this was a trip up to Maine and it was one of the first photos I took with an M. And that kind of like set the tone for our style, our brand, and what we wanted to do with photography. We were still early on in our, you know, photographing weddings. We probably photographed 10 weddings at this point. But the advice I have is, you know, don't focus so much on what other wedding photographers are doing or other photographers in whatever industry you're looking to get into. Really trust in yourself and, and find that style that you feel, you know, you're most comfortable with and what you want to, you want others to see your work as. And like I said, you know, a few minutes ago, it's not going to be for everybody. It's, you're going to, you're going to have, those who don't like it and you know i hate to say you got to grow you know tough skin and get used to that but for every you know for all, every 10 uh 
you know, photographers or clients who don't like your work, there's going to be triple that who do like your work and it's what's going to pay off in the end. So yeah, it's, it's what I, what I based our, you know, our whole brand off of. I trusted it and I stuck with it no matter how much I heard from others that, you know, why did you take this this way? Or, you know, your processing is horrible. This looks ugly. You know, this is over processed. Uh, you know, I ignored all that. And, you know, the, the, the positive um, comments uh, and critiques I got were what I stuck to and held on to. And I'm thankful that I did that. You know, had I started my career in my early 20s, I guarantee you I would have fell victim to all the negativity and went more along the lines of following what every other wedding photographer was doing at the time. So luckily for me, it was, you know, it was a little bit later in life and I was able to ignore some of that negativity. And thankfully it's been the biggest reason to uh, our success to this point. Well, that's, I think that's, that's great advice, uh, Jay. Uh, one last question. How, how much of the wedding photography business is the creative side and how much is the business side in your experience? The business side of it or of it takes up a lot more time than I ever would have imagined. Um, you know, there's times that we've had studio managers and they, they do a, you know, a good portion of what that business side um, takes up, but right now, and because of COVID, we don't have a studio manager. And for us, it's a little bit different as far as the business is concerned, because we, we run a studio with eight photographers. And like I said, we photograph over a hundred weddings a year. So the business side is a little bit different for us compared to a photographer who's just on their own, uh, and photographing 30, 40 weddings a year. But the artistic side of it is what got us to this point. It was what brought in the business basically and brought in the clients. You know, there's still so many new inquiries we get today uh, that, you know, they come in and they say, Hey, we've seen your work and you're the only photographer we're looking at. You're who we want to book. And you know, that makes our job extremely easy. They know right off the bat, Hey, we, we love your style. There's no question in our mind that you're who we want to go with. Any one of our photographers will do great. And, you know, then we have others that we have to work a little bit harder for who just come in and they, they're price shopping. But no matter what, we built our career and, you know, this brand and the studio on the artistic side of it. It was, you know, me and my wife sitting down and having weekly meetings of what we were going to do and how we were going to shoot things and, style we were going to shoot them in and it is it all comes back to that brand that we built and you know that is i mean they're both extremely important i would love to say that i you know i love the business side as much as i do the artistic side of it but it's kind of why me and my work my wife work so good together she handles the majority of the business side i'm the artistic side and it works out good um I don't touch her side of the business and she doesn't touch mine. Um, yeah, you, you know how that goes. You've seen us work together. So yeah, it's uh hope that answers your question there. Now that that's great, Jay. And uh, a lot of great comments uh, in the chat about uh, all the information that you've, that you've shared uh, and just your, your thoughts on the business. So we want to let everyone know how to stay in touch with Jay. You can follow him at uh, Jay Casario on Instagram, as well as his, his business, Twisted Oak Studios at twistedoakstudios.com. Uh, you can share your feedback with us if you'd like at academy at lakeacamerausa.com. So Jay, I'd really like to thank you very much for spending your time uh, with us today and giving some great advice and sharing some some great images. I really appreciate it. And our audience uh, is very grateful as well. So thank you very much, Jay. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. Appreciate it. It was great. So uh, until the next time, I wish everyone good light. And we'll see you the next time on Leica Conversations.